Welcome to the Serious Insight Podcast for Revenue Leaders. My name is Phil Dixon, and I'm the CEO of Serious Insight. And today, we're getting serious with Katie Gross, the Chief Customer Officer at Suzy. Welcome, Katie. Hi, Phil. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Uh, Katie, you're a powerhouse on revenue, data, and sales process. And so before we get too serious, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and at work and outside of work. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I'm Katie Gross, as you can tell from the accent. Um, I grew up, born and raised in Plymouth, England. Um, I actually was not a salesperson originally. I was originally a market researcher um, working as an analyst at a food and beverage company um, and found myself um, in sales uh, towards the end of my 20s. I moved to the USA about 10 years ago, first of all to Chicago um, and now more recently in kind of the New York, uh, New Jersey area. So um, that's a little bit about me and my career in terms of outside of work. Um, very lucky to have a lake house in northern New Jersey, um, and I paddleboard and kayak every single weekend throughout the whole of the summer. So, um, so yeah, I'm definitely a water baby. Grew up on the coastline and uh, now live on a lake. Nice. That's awesome. Uh, I've often found that marketers sometimes make the best transition to sales leadership. What's your been your experience with that? Yeah, I would agree. Um, I think it's it's funny because I, I I think before my perception of what sales was um, earlier in my career is my job would be to convince somebody to buy something and mm -hmm. cold call and, um, and kind of be that car salesman, as it were. I think what I realized that sales um, really is, is listening. It's about understanding what that company currently does, where their key challenges might be, find that white space for them. And if you have a product and solution that can actually help them do better, uh, move to the next step, um, save time, save cost, et cetera, then actually the, the happy exchange of the contract is just the final piece. It's really about the, the finding value between the two companies that's, that really is where the sales success lies. Absolutely, agree 100%. Um, and so let's let's talk about Susie. You're Katie. We're talking about Susie. You're the CCO at, at Susie. Tell us a little bit about the company and the customers and the value proposition. What do you yeah, guys sell? Ab absolutely. So we're an always on consumer insights platform. The voice of the consumer is, of course, incredibly vital to brands to make um products, ad campaigns, um, and make available um, through retail channels the products and services that consumers are going to want. In order to build those products, it's important to bring that consumer voice into the room with them. Now, traditionally, that has been through the hands of traditional market research agencies. So brands would brief those agencies, um, and those agencies would then go and work with a number of other tool providers, solution providers, panel providers to pull that project together. Um, and that may take kind of anywhere between six weeks and six months um, at great cost for them to analyze that data and go back to the brand with the recommendation, at which point it was the end of the piece of research. Now, brands today have to really adapt at the speed of culture. Consumers are changing faster than ever, particularly um, through pandemic years. And again, more so now through some kind of the economic challenges that we're facing. So brands have to adapt super quick. So Suzy came in um, as, a, uh, as a SaaS platform. We own our own panel. It is our own SaaS platform that has both quantitative and qualitative capabilities that have really helped those brands get those consumer insights at speed and have that flexibility to do it themselves. Now we're a disruptor yes. in the industry in that kind of space. And we've adapted even further ourselves in that we did our own consumer research with our own clients. And really that transition from working with a traditional agency to working with a SaaS platform was a, a leap too far for some. And so what we've done over the last two years is also build out what we call our center of excellence team who really can be that consultative um, team that works with those brands. But because we still utilize our own panel and our own tools internally, we've been able to get that kind of agency rigor, but with the speed of culture that those companies need for today. Gotcha. And so give me an example of a couple brands. What's the typical customer profile look like? Yeah, so we're really lucky. We have a very enviable client brand. Our tool is completely agnostic. So we work with companies in fintech, in food and beverage, in CPG, in consumer electronics, um, to name a couple of clients that present with us frequently on stage, Pepsi, Kraft, Mondelez. And the decisions we're helping them make every day are 
flavors, packaging, naming, testing, rebranding, um, decisions around acquisitions of new brands. Um, I'm really getting under under the needs for where are consumers not only purchasing those flavors um, or how are they purchasing those flavors, but where does it is it convenience stores? Is it retail? Um, is it e-commerce? So we work across what we call the four key pillars of market research, which is foundational research. Who is that consumer? Um, what are the motivations? What are the drivers um, of category purchase? What products and services are we innovating for those consumers? That's the second pillar. The third pillar, what are those advertising campaigns um, that can be reached and are talking to those consumers in an effective manner and in the correct place? And then what are those channels by which they purchase for them? So that retail um, shopper channel being the fourth pillar. Gotcha. And who's the typical decision maker in a buy process at the uh, target customer? Yeah, so we um, so traditionally it's been consumer insights teams um, okay. predominantly, but actually a tool like ours is so incredibly easy to use, and we have a number of templates built into the platform that have been built by the experts, so that anybody from R and D departments, revenue management departments, marketing departments, um, packaging teams, merchandising teams, a lot of them um, will also take out a Suzy license, knowing that there is that agency rigor that's built into the platform so that they themselves can also conduct that research um, without having to be a market research professional. So gotcha. some of our clients, we work with 15 to 17 different um, teams right across the organization. Gotcha. And so as you're marketing into or calling into prospects, What's the, what, where do you start? Top down, bottom up, in the middle, fan out? How do you, how do you go about it? Yeah, all of the above. So we account map um, with the best of them. So we build out very lengthy account maps. We have a, a wonderful um, SDR and, and go to market team where we'll build out account maps. We look at all the job descriptions, job titles that have matched our previous users. Um, in terms of tools, we use some great tools like user gems that tells us where our previous users have moved around to um, and so on. So we can start to map that out. Obviously, our sales team and our account executives are conducting very deep um, discovery um, conversations with those companies. So we can map out what are the business units, what are those buying centers, how do they make those decisions, how does that ladder through? Um, so deep, deep account mapping. Um and a deeper exploration um, within that. And different companies are very, very different. Some of our clients are very centralized buying hubs um, and others are completely decentralized where they really don't even talk to each other um, and those tools don't connect. So it's different for each type of account. Um, so uh, we have a slightly nuanced approach for each one. Gotcha. So you've got a, a bunch of buyer personas in your database. Uh, yeah, and exactly. And, and your marketing team are collaborating on how to get in front of target customers? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So there's those four key pillars that I kind of mentioned, foundational mm -hmm. innovation and so on. At some companies, it's pretty easy to tie it back to those four pillars. Um, mm -hmm. At others, it is more centralized. Um, it's obviously uh, a different type of methodology that may be a team that is wanting to understand foundational research versus a company that's or a team that's looking at innovation. So even the packages that they buy from us are wildly different from each other, even within the same company. Um, and then of course, we also map to industry as well. So for financial services, um, they may have a very different buyer persona than fintech and a very different buyer persona to um, the entertainment industry, for example. Gotcha. Cool. Well, I want to get into the buyer seller journey that you have and the systems that you use to facilitate process because now you're big on data. Um, mm -hmm. If you could just give us an example of the key milestones in the sales process or the customer journey as you have an interested prospect coming in at the top of the funnel. Yeah, absolutely. So in terms of the top of the funnel, so um, our top of the funnel is typically driven in three key ways. We have that, that SDR team um, that are outreaching. They are, we use a lot of tools. So we use Sales Loft for our email cadences and that we're frequently checking for which of those cadences are working, which are getting the most frequent replies. So email reply is certainly a score that we're um, looking at as well. That team generates approximately a third of our new revenue coming into the business. We also have a wonderful marketing team and a lot of content. And that content isn't about tools, but actually that content is about the consumer. What are those consumer trends? Um, so that content is definitely, um, I think, has a very different strategy than many other companies that will go to market with features and methodology conversations. Ours is just about the consumer. 
So about a third of our revenue comes from inbound leads. Those inbound leads, my sales team knows to follow up within five minutes. Um, and again, we put them into a cadence. We have the great calendar um, app within Sales Loft as well, where we can easily say to the prospect, here are the three times I'm available, please click to book a meeting. Um, and so on. And then a third of the, the uh, about a, the other third of the revenue is generated by the AEs themselves, working with um, other clients that we have had in the past, clients referring us to other folks um, with the great resignation and the great reshuffle over the past couple of years. A lot of our users have gone to their new companies and have wanted to bring Susie with us as well. Um, and I think it's really important for AEs to still prospect. So they spend a lot of their time um, prospecting, setting up their own cadences as well. So about a third of the revenue comes from AE-driven um, outreach as well. Kind of outbound referral with previous relationships? Yeah, absolutely. So user gems are recommended to everybody. It's been a fantastic tool for us. It tells us where all of our previous users now work, um, the new roles they're in. Um, and so it's an incredibly easy outreach as they have actually been users of our platform in the past. Very interesting. Does it tell you when they leave? Yes, it gives us a date of when their LinkedIn is updated, et cetera, yeah. et cetera. Does it like recommend a replacement? Uh, like, it doesn't. Who took the place of this person at your existing account? It just kind of follows people as they move. Just follows, yep. So it gives mm -hmm. us a report um, that states here are the seven of your users have recently moved roles. Here are their new yep. roles and new companies they're at, et cetera. Gotcha. Do you have anything that does that? Uh, that's something I've been looking for that will you can identify kind of key uh, admins, right, or influencers or power users within an organization. Uh, you know, the great resignation, people move, and you get a notification when one of your, you know, key users, power users leaves. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I don't have a no, I, I've not known of a tool that can do that. But what we do is when we do get that alert to say this person now has joined this company, we obviously right. contact, contact them at their new company. But we also right. email their old email address because it will often tell us the out of office coverage person. Gotcha. So you're kind of manually backfilling that piece. Yep, exactly. Got it. Great. Okay, so top of funnel. Got it. And then yeah. what is the, you know, what does the middle of the funnel look like? The sales process, and then we'll move to customer success yeah. and retention expansion. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So focusing on that net new sales team. So I have a net new sales team, an expansion sales team, and a customer success team. So those kind of three key areas. And then our center of excellence team is that fourth team there. So um, on the net new kind of process. So of course, that first meeting is um, discovery. Um, I definitely think that we, in my experience in sales over the past kind of 15 years, it has changed. Meetings are no longer 60 minutes. Um, they are moving down to 30 minutes. So the ability for a seller to, to discover whilst also running a demo at the same time, I think has become really important. Um, previously, we were given the luxury of having a discovery meeting followed by having a solution sure. meeting, followed by having a close meeting. Um, companies don't have the time for that. Um, so we've definitely adapted to making sure that our sellers can ask key discovery questions at the beginning, but then also continue that discovery throughout the, the sales pitch and the demo um, itself. We always get into platform. Our platform is a key sales point. It is the easiest platform to use in the market research industry. So the minute we actually log on and start to demonstrate that tool is really when we get that aha moment from companies and they can see how they themselves um, would use it as well. So that first meeting is a combination of both discovery and um, and product demo. Okay. Um, and then towards the end of that meeting, we really start to dig into, so talk to me about your market research process. How many projects, how many questions per project? How can we map that back? Mm -hmm. So we will typically then kind of map back um, what's called a learning plan um, from that company. What are they hoping to achieve? And we map out what those price points might look like for them. So that, that second meeting is um, sometimes a test project itself mm -hmm. um, or just us kind of showing how our tool can be utilized against the learning plan they have with the price points that are available um, to them. We have an average, average sales cycle of approximately 68 days um, okay. from the day the opportunity is open. So from that first meeting. Um, so in total, it's about 90 days. And we know that about 90% of all of our revenue is closed within 150 days. Once we start to go beyond 150 days, the close rates become much, much lower. Um, gotcha. And how many total meetings are you typically having in the sales cycle in that 68-day window? Three to five. Three to five. Okay. Yeah. 
yeah, exactly. So is there a lot of asynchronous discovery happening or is it just all on the meetings and there's just next steps, next steps? There is typically all on the meetings, but if there is things like test projects, um, et cetera, there may be a lot of follow-up questions on what is the size of the panel? Can you get enough of my particular consumer on your panel? Mm -hmm. um, uh, here are some of the three key methodologies we have. What would your approach be? So that will be dealt with over um, email as well. Usually that second meeting is where our, um, our key contacts will start to loop in multiple other departments um, and so on. Um, but typically we will, they will want to get started with a license and we build in a lot of opt-ups. So we recently just worked with a new um, insurance company who stated, we're pretty sure we're gonna need this very large package, but to get us started, let's start on the smaller tier, build in those two opt-ups so that we can execute very easily without having to go back to procurement. So we're often building opt-ups in at month three um, that have already been signed off by procurement that they can very easily action um, upon that time coming in. So gotcha. that is our kind of net new approach. And then our expansion approach, once we have an MSA signed with that parent company. Um, so if we were to sell to um, a, a brand within a parent company, for example, that expansion seller then takes that account map and starts working on all those other departments we mentioned there. So who is the R&D department? Who is the packaging department? Who is the merchandising department? And they work very closely with the customer success managers working on that account to build all those case studies to state, this is how brand A from your company is working with us. We can also um, you know, replicate similar processes for you also. But also brand A within a parent company in their first couple of months, having great experience will often recommend, you know, hey, my colleagues on this team over here should work with you also. And actually I have some other colleagues on a different brand that may work with you. So in that expansion area, referrals make up about 40 to 50% of our revenue that comes in because those current brands are recommending us around the organization. Um, and they want to have a joined up connected approach to research as well. So if mm -hmm. the consumer insights team is using it, they're gonna want the R&D team to also have um, access to the same consumers and the same templates of research. And then they're gonna want their revenue management team to have that same template. And then they want their shopper team, so maybe their Walmart or their target shopper partner at the brand to also have access to that research and be able to conduct their own research too. So it really starts to, um, to once we land, we really expand from there. We have a net revenue retention rate of 150% um, in those enterprise sized companies. So once we land them, they really expand. Nice. Well, to backing up a step, where do you, where do you collect discovery information? Is that in Salesforce? Is that in documents? Um, do you have a system dedicated to discovery? Or... Yeah, so we use Gong. So, and I will plug Gong all day long. <laughs> um, so all of our calls are recorded on Gong. Okay. Um, not only does that help the sellers, the customer success managers, and in a very fast growing company like ours, it helps us to onboard new sellers and customer mm -hmm. success managers in that we have um, what we call our Gong Hall of Fame, where they can click and listen to this is how we've pitched um, dyna dynamic segmentation. This is when we pitched a food and beverage company um, that worked in e-commerce. This is how we have pitched um, these solutions. This is how we've objection handled and so on. So we are tagging all of those types of calls to train everybody. And I, of course, love looking at the metadata of every time competitor X is mentioned, do we close win or do we close lose? Every time competitor Y is mentioned, what are the other keywords they're using um, in that? So that kind of metadata of um, and that analysis we can do on Gong um, as a leader is absolutely phenomenal um, as well. Would you say your sales handoff to customer success, right, when you close a deal is mostly here are the gong calls from the three to five meetings and customer oh, success yeah. goes and reviews those? Or what does the sales handoff look like? Yeah. So um, there is a document that they um, complete along with that customer success manager of here mm -hmm. were some of the objections that happened. Um, here was the, the buying decision. Here is, you know, they executed these three um, things in the contract, but we had discussed the possibility of them wanting to go into this fourth, fifth key area in the future. And the seller will join the onboarding. So we have a client implementation team um, as part of customer success who is responsible for onboarding. We know that a successful client will have used approximately, we have action-based pricing. They will have used approximately 32% of their actions in the first 90 days. And if that benchmark is hit, then we know they have a very high likelihood of renewing um, after that first 12 months. So month 13, as we call it, is one of our most important months to get them through that first renewal. The seller typically joins all three of those first onboarding calls. 
um, which is let's regroup on what, um, so the client doesn't have to repeat themselves. Let's regroup on why you bought this tool and what you're hoping to achieve. What are the key, um, key performance indicators that you're trying to reach with this tool? Um, and then of course there's hands-on keyboards. Okay, let's set up your audiences. Let's help you set up your templates, um, et cetera as well. So it's a very tight handoff. Um, and mostly because the seller is going to want to continue to expand and sell to other licenses. And they do that in partnership with the customer success manager who is going to be providing them with, um, hey, we just did our first project and they tested this new flavor versus that new flavor. And we did it within 48 hours. That CSM is always providing that feedback back to the seller so they have more stories to go sell to the other departments um, and other key uh, companies and other key companies that are similar to, to the one they just sold to as well. So we have a fantastic seller and CS um, partnership. Yeah, interesting. So this has uh, been, always been a complicated one uh, for me, but your your AEs maintain the accounts after the initial deal is closed because there's so much expansion opportunity. Yeah. Uh, how do you handle... Uh, bandwidth for AEs when you've got net new customers coming in and yet they have so many accounts to kind of handhold in yeah. the transition process and all that expansion mm -hmm. opportunity. How do you yeah. handle the, 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 the workload? Separating those two teams, have a net mm -hmm. new team dedicated to net new accounts. Mm -hmm. They are hunters. They know how to get through legal processes. They know how to get through procurement, have a separate expansion sales team. So we okay. close a large parent company that net new team passes it off to an expansion seller. That expansion seller has a list of maybe only five or six accounts. And their job is to only work on those five or six accounts and expands to the other departments within there. So while net new maintains that kind of large funnel of maybe 50 accounts that they're working on, right. the expansion team has a much smaller list to work on. So that's how we kind of separate it. I mean, this might be, I think, the only company I've worked at where that has been a very separate Clear. approach. Yeah. And it is exactly why we've seen such enormous growth on our on our clients an average order value, the client may come in at a $68,000 first license. Mm -hmm. And those clients will turn into $2 million clients in two years because we will go to every other department of that business. Sure. Now, how do you how do you deal with that comp scenario there? Does the AE still get comped a year mm -hmm. after for expansion? Do you have an overlay period where the AE is still getting the benefit? Because what I found is <laughs> AEs typically want to hang on to the deal you know, oversell it, right? Because if they've got to hand it off and somebody else is getting the expansion, right? They're going to want to try to get as much commission as possible. Yeah. Um, and sometimes that leads to hanging on to a deal too long. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So commission plans, I have a psychology degree. So commission plans are near and dear to my heart. Whatever you put in the commission plan will absolutely motivate the behavior. Um, mm -hmm. And I've definitely learned along the way um, and trying to adapt them as quickly as possible too. So for our AE, um, our net new AEs, there is a higher commission percentage if they sign a license with a brand new super enterprise company. So when mm -hmm. we close a very large um, new brand, they get a higher bump on that commission. They get to keep that account for about 90 days to get any immediate residual um, expansion opportunities. And they can build um, upsells into that license that they can claim on as well. I Once you. it goes over to that expansion sales team, that expansion sales team has the commission on any deals going further forward. It's a lower commission percentage than that very, very first deal because we know that very first one is the hardest one to, to bring in. Gotcha. So the, the expansion, the committed expansion, is that contractual or is that we build a model, we've got procurement to approve it. Mm -hmm. Is it part of the initial contract or no? It's an opt-up. So the initial contract will have, yeah. this is the initial contract. And here are opt three, three opt-ups that you can execute within that first 90 days. Mm -hmm. So that we know that when that SOW has been signed, the procurement team has seen those opt-ups, they're committing to them. So it's not, they don't have to execute on them. Right. But there is a cost saving if they sign with that opt-up because we're keeping it at the same rate as the, uh, as the original rate rather than kind of a late fee rate as it were. So... Um, that really helps. And it's similar with what we've really been successful with um, over the past 12 months also is multi-year deals. So we will provide a discount if that company signs a multi-year. Now that's been incredibly successful on our renewals in particular, but we started doing it in the net new team as well. And we've actually had six in 2022, six brand new companies who have signed to 24 month licenses with us. Very nice. Yep. Multi-year yeah. licensing is, is always a good thing. Predictable revenue on the renewal side. Very so, much, yep. Um, but the opt-ups are a 90-day window. 
Yeah, typically about a 90 day window. Yeah. So they get that first yeah. kind of 90 days. That's really when they mm -hmm. will see, yeah, this is a tool I'm going to be able to definitely use right. in the way I thought it was going to be. Quality is fantastic. Ease of use is great. Let's execute that opt up now. Gotcha. And Very that also to your to your point on will the sellers hold out on the sale to try and get the largest deal possible? Um, being able to execute on those opt ups means that they are still trying to get it over the line fast. So we can, you know, we know that time kills all deals. They can get it signed fast and still get that benefit of that opt up um, at a later date. Yeah, makes sense. Yeah, like balancing that is is very difficult. And I know a yeah. lot of sales leaders, uh, you know, have a lot of conversation about how to orchestrate that properly so that the yeah. proper behaviors are uh, compensated. Uh, definitely. And I've right. definitely made mistakes on commission plans in the past. I'm like, wait, why are the sellers sure. doing it this way? I'm like, because of the commission plan workaround. Okay, good to right. know. Let's adapt it and change it. I've never seen a commission plan stay the same multi years in a row. It's always right. adapted and tweaked. So yeah. And uh, yeah, how does that go for, for you changing commission plans every year? Yeah, we do. We try not to make too many changes. Um, I work mm -hmm. with the revenue operations team and our head of finance um, to make sure that can we, we automate it. We use a tool called Captivate IQ so that all of those um, payments are automated. We're not having to manually calculate at the end of the quarter. Um, come straight from Salesforce so that sellers can also see how much they've earned throughout the quarter. Um, and our customer success managers can see. So every time a dealer's closed one, it updates in their app so they know exactly what they're bringing home, which helps to motivate the um the behavior uh, as well. So yeah, we work uh, usually um, late December, early January on what next year's commission plan may be, where we needed to have tweaked it, made some changes, etc. Awesome. So your key metric in the first 90 days for customer success is product usage and value extraction. What are you exactly. using to measure product usage? Yeah, so we use, um, it's our own tool, first of all. So if, we, if they are purchasing um, 300 actions, um, it's essentially have they used 100 actions or have they used 90 actions, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But we also use mix panel or segment to track mm -hmm. their usage in the platform. So um, what are they clicking on? How often are they creating drafts? Um, how often are they logging in? We obviously have alerts that come into the customer success manager. Um, you know, your client has logged in, they've created a draft, but they haven't yet launched that survey. Or they've created three drafts and they haven't launched. Or they haven't logged in in the past 10 days or their usage past 30 days has decreased from the previous 30 days. So there's a lot of alerts that come into us. We haven't yet executed on the alerts going out. I know that, for example, with my own Peloton, I get a lot of emails from my favorite um, instructors saying, Katie, I haven't seen you in a while. I have a class at 4 p.m. Um, you email them which, back and tell them you're on your paddleboard? Every time I think to myself, oh, that's nice that the instructor cares about me. And then I realize they're using Mixpanel to automate that. So right. We, we have not yet automated back out to the client. We've automated a lot in, so the customer success manager doesn't have to manually track usage. It's a lot of, um, a lot of indicators coming to us. Awesome. Yeah, so I guess next I wanna move into, it sounds like you've got a really uh, strong hold on the pipeline, right? Mm -hmm. And the customer journey, uh, the conversion rates and the data from a management yeah. perspective that sit on top of your sales process. Yeah. What are you guys using there? What are the key conversion rates? And what do you really you know, look hard at? Yep. Insight Squared. So Insight Squared sits on top of obviously Salesforce, Sales Loft, etc. So I log, I joke that I log into that tool probably 155 times a day. <laughs> so we trick everything. Um, so from emails being sent, email replies coming in, LinkedIn inbox messages being sent, number of discovery meetings being set number of discovery meetings being completed, um, number of follow-up meetings being set and completed. What is that average time between that first meeting and that second meeting? Um, and then how many meetings in total leading to opportunities? So in terms of funnel metrics, how many emails to open um, uh, to, to first discovery meetings, how many first discovery meetings to open opportunities, how many open opportunities um, to close one? And of course, based on the average order value, date to close, et cetera, et cetera. We look at, of course, even with multi-year deals, um, multi-year deals are great. So we look at bookings numbers, but then we also look at annual recurring revenue. So it may be that we book $5 million, but the annual recurring revenue we added is 4 million because we were adding in a lot of those um, two-year deals. So bookings numbers are a great indicator, but annual recurring revenue added is also, of course, the important metric that we look at. 
sure. on the CS side, about- of course, churn percentages and so on, and the same funnel math on a, on a customer success manager perspective as well. Gotcha. How, how about managers? What tools are they using to kind of look at macro trends within their teams and using that for performance, coaching, et cetera? What are we doing there? Yeah, so same Insight Squared um, typically, <laughs> but they will go further into the weeds on individuals. So I look at it on a team level. So the customer mm-hmm. success team, the expansion team, the net view team, and are those funnel maths changing? And of course, in recessionary times like right now, um, the net new conversion rates are decreasing and the expansion conversion rates have stayed the same. Um, so I am right now looking at um, optimizing how many more sellers we move into that expansion area, knowing that current clients and gaining share of wallet um, is going to be a more successful strategy in 22 than trying to close um, new companies as budgets are being put on hold um, through recessionary times, etc. So I'm able to pivot and optimize immediately by looking at that type of data. Um, so the individual managers are doing that also, but then they're looking at it on their team basis and on their individual's basis. So looking at, um, the individual funnel math for each individual account executive. One thing we're trying to do right now. Um, so while they use Gong as a coaching tool, listening to those calls at speed 1.5, we haven't yet actioned upon the Gong scorecards that can be utilized. Um, we're actually setting that up. We've kind of aligned to what are the eight key things we're looking for from that first discovery meeting that we're going to start putting into Gong so we can use the Gong scorecard to really kind of formalize that. Because mm-hmm. at the moment, it's about listening to Gong calls at 1.5 speed and uh, anecdotally scoring them and sure. coaching. But we're going to put that into a more of a, a rigorous process um, going forward. And you feel like there's an opportunity to automate that scorecard? I would love if if Gong can, <laughs> yeah, double check on some of those words, et okay. cetera. So that's not a current goal is to automate the scorecard. Yeah, not yet. I believe the the I believe the way the scorecards are set up in Gong is that we actually we can align on the eight questions um, on a scale of one mm-hmm. to five, but the manager has to listen and actually score score that gotcha. in there. But um, okay. I'm excited to see um, how far Gong can take it as well. I know they have they have a extensive roadmap that can help us out. Yeah, we use Gong as well. A lot of peer review. Do you guys use it for peer review where you have AEs review demos or SDRs review calls with each other in a in a peer group? Ooh, we have not. But what we do, um, I will often put in who's listening to calls. So I will, um, there's nothing more than I love than a, a leaderboard of everything. So anything I can put in a leaderboard, I do. And Gong listening is certainly one of them. So and it's always, you know, that the SDRs that are, are listening to the most calls are usually the ones that have the highest response rates to their emails. So it's, the, the more they hear our clients, um, the more tailored their emails can become, etc. We don't do peer reviews on Gong, but we do, um, the A's will often pitch to each other. So they'll do pitch support and they will swap that up. Um, and different, different people will partner with different people to really kind of practice each other's pitches. We're launching a lot of new tools, a lot of features. Um, so one thing our SUP of customer success implemented was what she's calling pitch perfect, which is where everybody gets to pitch to each other and kind of practice that in a in a setting as well. So that's been a fantastic yeah. kind of rollout over the last couple of months. Yeah, the, I think one of the most surprising things for me with Gong was watching people review other people's meetings. Do you guys see mm-hmm. that or no? Like just yeah. on their own, no, no assignment, no project. People just logging in and listening. You know, how does yeah. this person pitch? Yeah. yeah. And I think for AEs, it's less about listening to the other AEs. It's about listening to that onboarding. So that all important sure. onboarding um, and those calls from clients who've been clients of ours for three to four years. That's when you get the real value of like, oh, that's how this company is using us. Now I know exactly what to say in my next pitch. Um, and I think, you know, if you're only listening to each other's pitches, you're only hearing the sales story, not the true value of the actual solution. Sure. Yeah. How about SDRs? Do you, do you find them listening to how each other pitch? Yeah. Absolutely. We uh, again we record the cold calls on sales loft. Um, it's interesting because we had a new, um, the, the SDRs were very reluctant to cold call um, uh, for a number of years. And we had a new uh, head of business development join us in November where very thorough training on cold calling. And we started sharing out all of those calls. Um, and they're, they're tricky. It is, I love them. Um, there has been many where that where the person's like, sorry, who is this? Why are you calling me? Sure. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure I have time. Yes. Oh, oh, you do? Oh, okay, sure. Actually, yeah, yeah, no, Friday at two sounds great. 
All right, great. Looking forward to it. And it's yeah. so great to see that kind of arc um, and reward that we, we post them out. We use Slack. So we post them out on Slack. You know, fantastic call here from Reed. Well done, Lexi, for this call and how you handled that objection. And that's made everybody feel a little more comfortable um, with cold calling as well. For sure. Yeah. I mean, you think getting told no as a salesperson is tough, right? Uh, you know, take a stint at being an SDR, making phone calls and having people, you know, hand it to you, right? On the yep. phone or hang up on you. Uh, unsung heroes of sales, for sure. Absolutely. Uh, yep. Absolutely. Um, so what's the big, biggest project you've got uh, going this year that you're trying to tackle? Yeah, so it's, to be honest, it's the, it's the economic climate that we're now selling in. <laughs> so, yeah. um, you know, we, we're lucky that we, we believe in agile market research, and that includes us being agile as a company um, as well. So I'm certainly looking at um, a number of different, I'm talking to a lot of other SaaS leaders um, and sales leaders in my own industry, but also in other industries. Um, there's been a lot of great content I've been trying to absorb. Inc. Magazine had a fantastic article very recently that is what does every SaaS leader need to do um, during um, this time. And it literally stated these are the 10 things a chief customer officer should do. And I'm taking each one of them incredibly seriously um, and working on how do we pivot and how do we adapt. Um, and that includes changing some of those sales rules, as I mentioned. How do we mm -hmm. repurpose um, sellers and making sure that we're not spinning our wheels on multiple discovery calls if it is going to have a lower conversion rate? How do we refocus and repivot on our current clients and growing share of wallet? Um, and, and again, making sure that multi-year deals are being sold, but the entire product suite is being added on so that we keep some of our competitors who have point solutions only, how to make sure that they are staying um, out of out um, of our clients' uh, you know needs needs dates as well. So, um, I would say the biggest project I have right now is definitely pivoting the uh, the business, right sizing the net new team, right sizing the expansion team, right sizing the customer success team, changing sales rules as to who sells what products and when um, to make sure that we are going after the dollars fast. Um, and uh, I'm making sure that we're there for our clients as well. I'm sure, you know, for, for many of them, it's a tough time as well as they try and pivot their business. Mm -hmm. um, so making sure, you know, how can we add value to our, our clients? We've had some fantastic success stories in, in making sure that we are staying relevant with what's happening in culture um, and making sure that we're helping them um, with their needs as well. Gotcha. Yeah. So what was the number one of the top 10 on, on the Inc. article? What was the number one thing you pulled away from it? Yeah, it actually, one of the things it mentioned is, um, you know, if companies are looking for, for less vendors and they're under pressure to bring in less vendors, uh, there were two kind of key points that it talked about there, which one is um, uh, companies are going, and companies are, are going to have to show to their chief finance officer um, the value of what they're buying, not the cost mm -hmm. of the tool, but the value and what does it do? Um, mm -hmm. So if we don't want to end up on the cutting floor, um, as it were, we have to make sure that we are providing language to our buyers that is showing the return on investment. Um, and so for many of those companies, particularly within market research, sometimes that ROI story is what's the value of, um, of having a seatbelt? You don't know until you don't have it. Right. Um, but we also have on the other side, many great examples of when a company either decided to not launch a flavor because it didn't score very well and therefore they saved themselves um, millions of dollars. But when they have launched a new product or made an acquisition based on our research that has helped them grow as a business. So we're trying to focus not just on um, when we, especially when we come up to renewal time, um, not just focusing on the costs and, and so on, but also the value that our tool has provided to them. Mm -hmm. um, and the second key thing it kind of really talked about was uh, growing that share of wallet. So if you have a product suite, making sure that every single one of your products is um, is focused on that client. And we're, we're lucky that we have a lot of different solutions here at Suzy. Um, and so I've been looking again at Gong, actually, and there's a few of those um, solutions we have that are only one slide in the deck and are only talked about as kind of an and we have. Um, and I want to make sure that we focus on product-based selling. So going back and making sure that if the company decided to only move forward with two of our products, that, that third product gets its own day in the sun with its own discovery meeting and its own sales process. So deepening our share of wallet across the entire product suite is um, definitely going to be a focus for my AEs um, going forward as well. Awesome. Well, Katie, you've been amazing. I want to thank you. We are up on time, but thank you so much for joining I feel like I could talk to you all day about sales and revenue leadership uh, and just love what you're doing at Suzy and your approach. Thanks, Phil. It's been a pleasure. Yeah. Thank you so much.